الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعظم الله وأجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا أبي عبد الله الحسين Our dearest viewers, thank you for joining us for our third night, our third show here on Verses of Love and we send to you our condolences upon the martyrdom anniversary of our dear third Imam, Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam and indeed his family and companions and we send and extend our condolences to our awaited saviour, who we know will come and avenge the death and the blood that was spilt on the holy land of Karbala. We hope that thus far over the past two shows, you've started to take a slightly more educa educational approach towards the Masa'ib of Aba Abdullah, and you've started to be able to connect with the lessons that we take from those tragedies. We connect with tears, but we also need to change those tears into actions into things that we can manifest into our daily lives that we're able to change ourselves and actually use that slogan of Ya Hussein into something a little bit more than just 10 days of grief and sorrow. And we've been doing this through deriving lessons but also through the means of poetry by my dear brother, Salaamu Alaikum Alaikum Salaamu Alaikum 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 Yeah, as, as the theme now is, is to connect with the Ahlul Bayt Alaihi Wasallam um, specifically Imam Hussein and, and the tragedy surrounding Imam Hussein, um, the companions and the brothers and the, w the women and the children, uh, through the mind and through the heart as we try to um, get you closer to the Ahlul Bayt through poetry as well as through uh, a bit of wisdom uh, when it comes to really changing um, yourselves, self-development and really developing um, and taking a couple of lessons really seriously um, into into uh, Muharram and beyond Muharram, yeah. beyond just the 10 days of, of the morning and the lip service as, as, as um, some people want to, to put it. Um, so tonight, inshallah, we are remembering um, the first five nights what we're doing is is remembering the, the women and children of Karbala because usually um, within the 10 nights they're not really mentioned, they're mentioned after, um, after Ashura. Uh, the plight of Sayyidah Zainab uh, and the women and children through Sham and Kufa. But uh, what we're doing is we're going to focus on the women and children during the first five nights and then focus on the companions oh, during, during the latter. Um, and tonight is Sayyidah Ruqayya. Yes. We decided for, for this third night for it to be devoted to the daughter of Imam al-Hussein, Sayyidah Ruqayya. And as we know, the, the Masa'ib of Sayyidah Ruqayya is plentiful. It's, it's the journey, it's the arrival into Kabbalah, it's the thirst, it's the demise and murder of her brother, of her cousins, of her uncle, of her father, the let go. Whilst this list goes on, it's important that we then actually connect with her and we actually understand some of the lessons she was trying to teach us. We, it's, it's very easy just to see her as a very young child that we feel sorry for and we grieve over, but there's, a, there's actually more to it. We forget the family that she was part of and their role to us was to demonstrate things that we could learn. So. Just to begin with, one very simple point that we see about her is that amongst the children that were, um, that were there present in Karbala, she was almost like a hub for the children. She was the one that they would go to. It was like their, their, their captain, their role model of the children was Sayyidah Ruqayya alayhi salam. And she inherited this, this responsibility of leadership at such a tender age, something that many of us are, are told and an attribute that is very valued and we're told to try and acquire in the workplace. But there's something very valuable in this leadership that I think especially during these nights, whilst many of us have the opportunity to serve in the way of Abba Abdullah, that we should apply it. And this leadership to some is just seen as, okay, I'm holding a majlis, I'm going to be reciting a majlis, I'm going to be doing the audio-visual, like, whatever it is, you have a responsibility of leadership in this. And with that comes responsibility of actually being someone that's the flag bearer of the message you're actually portraying. If you are, for example, I like to use the analogy of football, if you're the captain of a football team, you inherit the qualities of that football club. If, you're a, if it's a family club, you're seen as the captain, someone that I actually represent this club on the pitch, but also off it. It's a family club, so I'm going to spend time with family. And that's mm. going to be the way in which I portray myself is, I'm going to be calm, I'm going to be relaxed, I'm going to be friendly with children, da da da, da. Similarly, Sayyidah Ruqayya represented a message of none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you are serving in her majlis, you must also take these similar 
elements of leadership, of responsibility on your shoulders and mannerisms that you need to follow the way that she would have done with her language, that she would have done with her akhlaq, that she would have done where faced with trial and tribulation and frustration, she wouldn't come back swearing here, getting frustrated here, being chilled out there. It was a case of conviction and knowing what her message was. And that's why the children would rally around her. So the message to apply for you is this. If you are fortunate enough to have been given the opportunity to serve in the majlis of Abba Abdullah and in, this, in the message and in the majlis of his dear daughter, then don't just serve on the face level. Once people leave, be still a beacon for that message. Be someone that if you hear the words of backbiting being said, cut it off straight away. If you hear words of prayer being delayed, ensure they are fasted and hastened. If you hear people talking negatively about some of the organizers similar to backbiting, if you hear these negative words being spoken about, try and correct them. But be a beacon. Don't be someone that is actually on the face of it. Yes, I'm in the service of Abu Abdullah and hence I'm a leader. But actually, as soon as the eyes are off me, I'm going to return to mannerisms that a leader would not accomplish. For then, you are doing this the disservice towards the message of Sayyidina Raqayya. So a very simple lesson that we derive from someone aged just 3, 4 or 5. And if you are watching this aged 15, 20, 25, 30, whatever you may be, take this lesson from this young girl, inshallah. Yeah. Wise words. And uh, Sayyidina Raqayya was, uh, or she passed away. Uh, in Sham, in Syria, uh, and and the, over the last couple of years, there has been a strong yearning to visit Sayyidah Ruqayya because of her stand, because of the way that she passed away, um, which will allude to the, the her tragedy in, in the latter parts of the show. Um, but before the political situation in Syria, a lot of the people who went to visit Sayyidah Zainab in uh, in Sham, in Damascus, in Syria, would also, alongside that, visit Sayyidah Ruqayya. Mm. And so this poem, inshallah, as we um, remember, is visiting Sayyidah Ruqayya and not forgetting her stand, not forgetting her leadership and her qualities um, associated with the Ahl al-Bayt, How many have visited her? Ruqayya, our master and guide The hearts cannot bear to leave her Like the sand cannot leave the tide At her grave the prophet's crying over the one who in grief died She died from overflowing tears And by her father's head she lied Jesus sits Jesus visits with his Bible At her grave he breaks down and cries Moses joins him with his Torah His heart from grief breaks open wide Breaks open wide O oh, Prophet Shed your tears Over her Visit this sad child Visit this sad child her screams and cries destroy the time But now she lies silent and still And she was just a small child How can her heart how can her heart they break and kill? Oh, she I come toward her grave 
your desires she will fulfill she is the mercy of Allah she is the result of his will in her eyes the blood of Adam an angel's heart so beautiful souls ache upon hearing her scream in the heart her love is instilled she's in pain for Hussein her tears Visit this sad child Art is for her, destroy her fire Tell me how much must they weigh Do they weigh more than her deep grief For her father taken away oh she I leave drop everything there has not been a better day to visit her to shed your tears at her grave your early pay this allegiance in blood and tears and at her grave forever stay visit her broken and torn heart it broke when she saw his pure face it broke when she saw his pure face Visit her, kiss her grave Ruqayya, visit this sad child Visit this sad child Many thanks to the poets and <laughs> visit this sad child and so many reasons to be sad, to feel lonely, to feel oppressed. And I think one thing that we connect with her on is the tribulations and the sheer number of tribulations that, we, that, that, that she faced, as we mentioned just slightly earlier. Her brother, cousins, father, that all of those males in her family that meant so much to her not taken, but taken and visually seen, butchered to death as such a young girl. And it's a part of me thinks what, what was tough of her? Was it seeing all of that happen, but still being able to call out to them? Or was it on the night of Sham al when individuals came to her to rip her earrings mm. and that sense of no hope to call out to no one at that point? Mm. You look one size, and you see your uncle laying. You look to the other and you see your cousins and brother and father laying and you're, you're just lost. You, you actually, at that moment, I feel she was just lost. And then I think, well, how, how in any way can someone of that age even bear that sort of calamity? And when we look and try and understand why one thing really sticks out, and that is the notion, and it's repeated so much, but again, very specifically to her alayhi salam specifically is patience a simple simple asset that we need to have in our toolkit day to day but so difficult to acquire mm -hmm. and there's a beautiful hadith from imam ali alayhi salam where he says as meaning patience makes light work of calamities it just patience makes light work of calamities and it just summarizes that entirely. If she didn't hold this level of patience, these calamities would have overcome her. Oh. 
It was an absolute necessity. And it then makes us question, us as individuals slightly older, what is then our threshold? What is our threshold when it comes to patience? I myself just driving here early was getting frustrated in traffic. That's, that's my threshold finished. But if I were to then be saying, and which I do, Oh Allah, let me be among the army of the one who will avenge the blood of Abba Abdullah. The tests of patience that I'll have to endure will be significantly harder. And perhaps starting to go, along, uh, go, go along the lines of death is things I will have to witness. But do I really have this threshold of patience that will even allow me to overcome these calamities? But Imam Ali says, as we said, patience makes like, work of, like light work of calamities. Mm-hmm. And hand in hand with this patience goes something that I just admire her for to a level I can't describe, which is throughout all these ordeals, this notion of Alhamdulillah and praise towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was constantly repeated. And again from Imam Ali, he says, contentment is the capital which will never diminish. You can have a level of contentment when it comes to money, to fame, to looks, to da 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 but contentment is a capital that no matter what, if you're in the worst of worst of situations, if you're content, that contentment can't be taken away from you. It's something that's in your pocket and your contentment never diminishes. And thus, Sayyidah Ruqayya, having seen all of this, she has on one side a level of patience that allows her to enjoy it, but on the other side, a level of contentment that just makes her understand the situation that she's within. Mm-hmm. And this no doubt came from the lessons that were driven within her by her father, by her grandparents, by her siblings, the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So something to take away is this, the patience and the contentment that we hold, and the patience and the contentment that we're going to learn from them and actually trying to implement. For no doubt there were moments in this Masa'ib where she would have struggled to a degree we'll never understand, and we understand that at these moments she would then look to a source of inspiration, to a source of patience. An individual that exhibited this notion of patience and contentment, none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al Mu'minin, mm-hmm. the commander of the faithful. It said that many of the individuals involved in Karbala would look towards Najaf, to guide me towards where Najaf is. So I can complain but seek inspiration from this man. Mm, exactly, and on that, on that specific tone, on looking towards Najaf, um, that is exactly what Sayyid Ruqayya did when a man came up to Sayyid Ruqayya on the, uh, during the aftermath of, of the killing of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And she says to the man, please direct me towards Najaf. Um, and the man says, well, Najaf is far away. What do you want from there? She says, I need to complain. As uh, Sadiq said, uh, I need to complain to my grandfather of what befell my father and my, my aunties and, uh, and all of my family members. And in this poem, which Nuri Sadar uh, mentions, to Najaf I turn. Oh my grandfather, I miss my father. To Najaf I turn, ask him to return. I miss my father. I am, <coughs> I am Ruqayya, oh Ali. I have no father, so help me, oh grandfather. I ask as a daughter who misses her father. Don't I need a father to be called a daughter? Alone, so confused, all else I've refused.
refuse only him I am ask him to return I miss my father I was taught from birth that I brings miracles calls your name every tear that from the eye I trickles with your I'm right with your arm raise the Khaybar's gate of my eye trials Return my father and his smiles and cuddles the gates of Khaybar my griefs heavier and its weight it burns ask him to return I miss my father Muhammad's the son, Ali's the moon I was taught. Oh, Ali, between the day and night, I am caught. I wake yearning him I wake crying and distraught at night I can't sleep because he's my final thought Christ for me the moon my days in ruin from me sorrow learns ask him to return I miss my father I miss my father. Many thanks to the poets. No reason. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And to end this this night on Sayyidah Ruqayya alayhi salam, whilst we take all these lessons from her, once whilst we try to connect with her struggle, do not forget the very simple point of her young innocence. Her very young innocence, if you know sisters or you have a daughter or cousins or nieces that are off that age remember that innocence that they have imam hussein has a beautiful line where he says a house without sakina would not be worth living in a house without sakina would not be worth living in that's the love of a father to a daughter naturally and naturally a father to a daughter a father puts their daughter to sleep the daughter rests in their father's arms in their lap in their chest the father will read stories, will make sure they go to sleep, put them, put, put them to bed, put the blanket over them and leave the room. And this was a similar thing that happened after the death of Imam al Hussein, but in a very different manner. Mm. For they found Imam Hussein's dear daughter lying upon the chest of Imam Hussein, but in the context of a beheaded body trampled in the night alone. Yet we still see that innocence of Sayyidah Ruqayya still there. And finally, I leave you with this.